so my name is Adam Steinberg, and I'm an artist and a scientist. I do both of those jobs in an equal fashion, and people generally refer to me as a visual scientist. So I take raw data and create visualizations out of that so that people can understand the data. And often scientists will bring me their data when they don't understand the data, and then I help them understand that data and do their experimentation after we visualize that together. And so I work on posters and talks and all kinds of stuff. And then I work with universities and I work with pharmaceutical companies and I do uh, book publishing. So Leninger Biochemistry and Lotus Cell Biology, those are both my books and probably seven or eight other books that are very familiar. I've worked on all of those. So, Holly? And Science and Nature Magazine. Those are always, always impress me. Many covers of science. Um, I'm Holly Walter Kirby. I am a chemist and a playwright. I taught for 25 years in, in a, a local college, college in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I've done a lot of research, mostly in informal science education. And uh, in, in my teaching, I decided that um, it would be great to teach outreach. So while I was teaching in college, I, I got a couple of grants from the National Science Foundation to try to develop a, a system to use what I knew in playwriting to um, actually teach chemistry. And we did develop something that was called Fusion Science Theater. And now I work with Adam and by myself to try to bring this in and help scientists to communicate. So we're excited to be here today to talk to you about using principles of story for effective, effective science communication in talks, posters, and visuals. So next slide. So there you are, right? The scientist, the researcher, and you're there thinking about doing science communication. So the big science communication products that we do, right, are presentations, posters, and papers. Those are the big three, but of course there's many, many different ways to communicate science in symposiums, talking to people in the hallway or on social media. There's all different kinds. Right, we'll cover these bigger ones today. So what's actually happening when you're doing science presentation, right? You're gonna give a presentation, you climb up on stage and you actually are saying things and you want the audience to understand what you're saying, right? The whole point of it is to get understanding. And the same is with a poster. If you're standing there giving a poster presentation, you need understanding from the people who are around you listening to you give that presentation. And of course, with a paper, you take all that time and energy to put that stuff into words, put it out into the world. You want people to read that paper and understand what you're saying, right? So it's literally all about audience. If you think about it, it's about audience. And so let's take a minute and look at the audience. Holly and I have been doing this for a long time. We always work with you and we ask you, okay, who's your audience? What you tell us every time is peers, right? And we think you do say peers because that's an easy audience to reach. It's something that you're familiar with and then you don't have to think about it. You say, well, I'm talking to my peers. I'm just gonna move on from there. But we know for a fact that you are very rarely ever talking to your peers. And in fact, outside your institution, you're talking to collaborators who are in different peer groups than your own, right? They have their own science and their own research. You're talking to funders to get your, your research funded, writing grants and things like that, policymakers, and the most important, the people who actually pay our salaries, right? The taxpayers, rarely do we ever talk to them, but we should be talking to them all the time. And then within your institution, you're trying to talk to deans or administration. You're talking to your own teams all the time and students. And of course, when I put students up there, you're thinking, well, undergraduates and postdocs and graduate students, but I'm talking about all of us. We all instantly become a student when we try to understand someone else's research. Okay? So those are your audiences. And so to talk about what you guys actually do, I'm gonna hand it over to Holly and let her speak for a while. So let's say you need to give a talk and uh, to one of the audiences that Adam mentioned. 
and you want to give a talk about your research, your beautiful, complex, detailed research that took you, you know, three to five to 10 years to do. And how do we normally prepare a talk for these audiences? Well, normally what scientists do is we take all of our research, we want our audiences to understand, we take all of our research, um, all of our data, all of our methods, background, and we try to put it into the talk. And we have strategies to try to do that. You know, we sort of load up slides and tables and graphs, and then we give the talk to our audience and we talk pretty fast. And then when it turns out we don't seem like we're gonna have enough time, we skip through slides and say, sorry, I can't talk about this right now. Now our goal of course is to get our audience to understand, but if you use this approach, chances are they will be more confused than they understand. So um, our goal, what, so that <laughs> means that we should ask the question, what does it take to get the audience to understand? Let's think about it from the point of view of the audience. Um, listening to a talk and trying to understand it is a lot like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. The speaker is handing you pieces, sometimes like a whole pile of pieces at the same time. And what you need to do is you need to examine the pieces, then you need to put them together with what you already know, and then you need to assemble the whole into this coherent picture so you can see what's really going on. In other words, to understand a talk, you need to process all that information and you need to engage or invest yourself in the, in the process of understanding. Now, most of us can do this for a while when we're listening to a talk. Um, but then, you know, at some point, the pieces are coming so fast and there's so many of us, many of them, so that we start to um, get overwhelmed. Things are, we get a little lost and then we get kind of confused. And then when we get really confused, at some point, we start thinking about what we're going to have for lunch. And when that happens, when you get to that point, it doesn't really nobody's learning about your research anymore. And actually, when you get to that point, it doesn't really matter to the audience that you're even up there giving a talk. So is there a better way? Is there a way um, that we can, is there a method of science communication that actually help your audience engage, process, and understand? And if there is a way, will it work for any audience in any discipline? And will it work not just for talks, but for also for posters and papers? And I'm here to tell you that yes, there is a way. Um, Adam and I developed this method when we were teaching a class uh, in the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. The course we taught together was called Illuminating Discovery. And we use this method to help um, graduate students and postdocs create various communication products like the three minute naked talk, which of course refers to the fact that you don't have any visuals, not what you're wearing or not wearing at the time. Also, we taught infographics, posters, and then a talk with slides. And then I've also used the same method I'm talking about in a course that I teach with our colleague, Joan Jorgensen, a veterinary science professor. Um, we teach students how to use this method to write papers or manuscripts. So what's the method? We're calling it story form science and we have developed various materials to use to help scientists develop the products I just mentioned. Now, so what's the secret with Storyform? How come it can do everything? And the secret, the secret sauce is that Storyform, like the name, is based on story. So why is this important? Like, what does, what's so great about story? Well, um, let me 
show you, and I'm gonna do it by sharing um, a story. Well, actually a kind of story. I'm gonna share with you the basics of a murder mystery. Okay, so what happens in a murder mystery? Starts off with finding somebody who's dead and it was not an accident. And then they call in a private detective um, or an investigator and their job is to identify the killer, the person who committed the murder by conducting an investigation. Now in the course of this investigation, they kick up, they find all sorts of clues and evidence like maybe a promising witness or a, a weapon or perhaps a motive, right? And then using all of these, the investigator is able to put all this together and identify the person who committed the murder. And then that person gets their comeuppance, correct? Isn't that how it goes? Anybody who's been up late with a murder mystery knows that they're really engaging and it, they're, and the viewer or the reader is highly motivated to process all the information that they're given, not only to find out what's gonna happen next, but to understand what is going on. However, a murder mystery is not at all the same thing as a murder investigation, right? A murder investigation is real life and um, it's made of all these details, all this evidence, weeks or maybe years of, of just backbreaking work. And hardly any of us would relish the idea of sitting there and listening to all the information involved in a murder investigation. A murder mystery is a story. Now, the interesting part is we have reality and we have a story. But the question I have for you is, like which one does a better job of engaging us, of getting us to process uh, specific details and getting us to understand what's involved in solving a crime um, and makes us really kind of appreciate and feel like we're there. Well, it's the murder mystery, not, the mur not all the deluge of information on the murder investigation. Likewise, your research talk should not be, is not, and should not be all of your research, right? If you want to engage people and get them to process and understand, you need something that's more like a story. We've, we have this method and we have these materials to help scientists take your research and turn it into something that's not fiction, it's accurate, but it engages people like a story. So how do we do that? Well, I wanna, I wanna start off by telling you just a little bit about story. I'll tell you five principles and here they are. Journey, travelers, question, focus and show, don't tell. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through these five principles and I'll show you how they work in a murder mystery. And then I'll show you how we use them to help scientists create really engaging talks and visuals and posters and everything else. Okay, so first principle, journey. Stories are like journeys and they're plotted out in a sequence of well-established steps. Like in a murder mystery, the steps in a murder mystery are the beginning or the current world, the problem and the approach, then the episodes where somebody tries to solve the problem, the climax or the outcome. And then that's really where the story's over, right? But we like to get the ramifications of the outcome. We like to see how it affects the world. So we have the ending or what we call the better world. These are the steps of the, the arc or the journey of the murder mystery. Now we use these exact same steps when we help scientists craft engaging talks. Notice our template has a place for all of them. 
And what scientists do is they just fill in the squares of our template and then they can map out their own journey. Principle two, travelers. In a murder mystery, who is the main traveler? The answer of course is the main character. In a murder mystery, that's the detective or the investigator. And they're the ones that travel through the steps to try to solve the problem. Now, the audience is not in the story. This is all in the story world, right? The audience is not in the story. And yet we feel like we are. You know, I'm the person that has to jump up and, and leave, leave the TV room because I'm scared to death. Well, why? Because, you know, I'm not in the story. Well, the way this happens is that the main, the audience identifies with the main character and they step into their shoes. And then as the main character is traveling through the story, the audience is traveling through the story too with the main character. Now, the same thing is true or when we use this method for scientists. Um, the audience is there. If you want to engage them in your research journey, then you need to provide them with a main character so they can step into their shoes. And if you're the researcher, then that main character is you. Now, I'm not saying that this is gonna be a story about you. Not at all. This is not gonna be a personal story. This is a story about your research. But if you want the audience to actually go, go along with you in this research, then you have to step up and put yourself in the story. Principle three, stories are built around a question. Questions are incredible things because the moment someone asks an intriguing question, there's like a space that opens up in our brain and we, we it's a space of uncertainty. And what we want to do is we want to fill that space to close it down. We want to know the answer. And story makes use of this psychological phenomenon. In a story, the main question goes up there in our template. It's introduced um, after the problem. And in a, a murder mystery, what's the main question? Well, it's who done it, right? Which I, I really, I cannot figure out that contraction, but there it is, who done it, that's what they're called. And then once that question is introduced or arises in the minds of the audience, then it is answered a little bit at a time in a story, right? It's kind of teasers until finally in the end, you get the answer. You have to wait all that time until you finally get the answer in the end. The first part of the story sets up that question and the second part of the story delivers the answer. Um, because of that question, the audience wants to know the answer and they are willing to go ahead and process all the clues and information in the middle in order to not only wait for the answer, but actually predict the answer. I mean, that's pretty impressive that there's that sort of cognitive load that the audience is willing to get in there and actually struggle and try to figure things out. Now, how do we bring that to our method? In our method, we also have a question. And the question, the answer to that question is the results that you want to present in whatever talk you're given. The question gets set up in the first part of, the, of your research talk, and then it gets answered a little bit at a time to lead the audience to the final results. Your audience is engaged because they want to know the answer to the question. So they're willing to, you know, um, not understand a few things as they're going along if they're actively putting it together and the question guides them in doing that. Principle four, focused. Stories are about one thing, they're focused. 
the main thing that focuses them is the question. The audience is focused on the answer. But in the process of actually going through the evidence and figuring out the answer, the audience also learns a lesson, one main lesson or message, or sometimes it's called the moral of the story. When researchers do our method, they first focus on the audience, who they're speaking to. And then the first thing that they do is they decide what's the main message? What's the main thing I want my audience to learn from my talk? And then we work backwards from there. Principle five, show don't tell. This is my favorite one. Okay, in a murder mystery, in a story, the audience sees for themselves. In a murder mystery, you don't hear that a witness was found and this is what they said. Instead, you get to see them interviewing the witness, right? You don't hear, oh, a gun was found and we think it was a murder weapon. No, you see the gun being pulled out of a lake, dripping with algae hanging off of it. And if there was a transfer of funds that's important, you often don't hear about it. And usually you don't even see like a little line on someone's bank statement. You see, you see a suitcase of cash. Why? Why do we try to show these things? Um, it's because images are processed in a different part of the brain than languages are. And it's a much directer route, more direct route. Um, and when we see images, we actually feel like we're there. It's part of narrative transportation that brings us into a story. Now, how do we use this principle when we're helping scientists use our method and um, come up with talks and posters? We use icons. You know, those that grid that you saw in a couple slides, well, scientists take those, that grid, and they cut squares out of it, and then they draw little pictures. You can see, here's some examples. You can see that the scientist has drawn bacteria and then some substance that's been extracted from the bacteria. The scientist, who's by the name is Meyer Kajla, um, the scientist is interested in the substance because he's looking for a mosquito repellent. And there's how, there's how he has represented a mosquito repellent. And he devises in the end this feeding apparatus. He's got food for the mosquitoes, it's dyed red. He impregnates it with that substance that he's extracted from the bacteria. And yep, it actually repels mosquitoes just like he hoped. Now, why do we use icons? Um, a lot of people think I like to use words, not icons. Why do we have people use icons? Well, your job is to look at all your research and all the, comp, the, the, the web of information in your research and to pick out the pieces that are the ones you want to arrange in a story structure. This is hard to do. And the perfect way to do it is to represent the pieces of information that you think are essential through icons. They're simple, they're visual, they represent things, and they're flexible. You can move them all around. If you decide a story is not working, then you can move them around. It's an iterative process. Um, I've also, we've also seen people typically use them as props. They have like a little play and they, they move these icons around and say, and then here comes the catalyst and energy is given off. Or you'll see later on, like um, these, these two molecules break apart and then they go back together again. So, and also when they're first giving their talks in the rough drafts, these icons act as cues. So they don't have to write things out. They can just talk from the icons. Bottom line is, I don't know exactly why, but icons really, really work. Five principles of story, once again, journey, travelers, question, focus, show, don't tell. 
And then there are two more things we do in the method to help scientists come up with really engaging um, products, communication products that our audiences will understand. The first one is feedback. Um, there's no way that you can tell if your talk or anything else is engaging or if it's understandable unless you give it to somebody and ask them, did you understand this? Or what didn't you understand? Or what part wasn't engaging? We don't just, so these are all pictures of people getting and giving feedback. We, and we teach you how to do this. It's not just like I liked it or I didn't. We teach you how to give feedback. We have a feedback rubric that helps people give really good constructive feedback. The second thing that you need in addition to the five principles is you need a way to revise. And with good feedback, then the next step is we help you to revise your product. And these are pictures, uh, photos of people presenting their posters and their talks, getting feedback from a larger audience and revising once again. We'd like to show you uh, a short talk, a three minute thesis talk uh, that, that this person, Sing Yu Peng, who was a, uh, an engineering student at the UW Madison. Now she's a, a scientist at Dow. She used our method uh, to come up with a three minute thesis talk and gave this talk um, at the three minute thesis competition in one second, second place. So um, I'll turn it over to you, Adam. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, and I'll start sharing. So in this part of the talk, I'm gonna show you examples of how we do all this in class. So you'll see real research examples now, from now on. So I'm gonna let Sing Yu talk. So you're gonna hear her speak and I'm gonna bring up her icons on screen so you can see how she used icons. Wish they have to go into, there we go. I'm gonna bring up her icons as she's speaking. So you'll hear her speak as I bring up the icons. Morning, everyone. My name is Xin Yue Peng. I'm a fifth year PhD student in chemical engineering. Today, I'm going to talk about storing solar energy with chemistry. People in the world need energy, and all the energy we need in a year is delivered to the Earth by the sun in one hour. So take a guess, what percent of our electricity today is generated from solar energy? 40, 20, 10? The answer is none of the above. It's only 1%. Why we don't take advantage of this abundant renewable resource? Because there are many challenges of using solar. First, the sun only shines during the day, so we need to store a lot of energy for the night. Second, the sun shines more at deserts than cities like Madison, so we need to store and transport the energy from one place to another. Well, you may say, we can use batteries, but they are too expensive and heavy to transport. So our question is, can we find a new way to store energy that is cheaper and lighter? As a chemical engineer, I'm working on storing solar energy in chemical bonds. We are looking for a special type of molecules. When they are exposed to sunlight, their chemical bonds are broken by absorbing energy from the sun. We can then store and transport these separate parts. When we need energy, we just let the parts go back together. When the chemical bonds are reformed, the energy is released. This reversible process can happen over and over again. Sounds great, right? But here is the complication. There are millions of chemicals that are possible to use for storage. How can we know which one is the best? So we can use computer to help us. During my PhD, I developed a computational program to screen out the best candidates from a large chemical database. For any given chemical, our tour can tell us whether this bond breaking is reversible, how strong the bond is, and most importantly, what's the storage cost. 
Using this screening tool, we have successfully discovered several promising chemicals that can store five times more energy than the same weight battery and at a lower price. Imagine one day in the future, all gas stations are replaced by solar stations. Instead of gas, our cars are now run on these special chemicals that harvest solar energy and do not emit CO2. On that day, we are living in a truly sustainable world. Thank you. And so you can see how she created icons for each piece of her story and then plunked them into each of the boxes on the template. And of course, this was not her first attempt. This came after iteration and feedback, but you can see how it's used. And we have many, many students who have gone through this, many, many graduate students and postdocs who have done this. And so we'll show you some of their other work. I'm gonna move into infographics and how we use this very same method to create infographics. And I'll show you seeing use infographics based off using this process. So to do infographics, we break it into two parts where we have a setup and then we have a delivery, okay? And so seeing use setup, you heard her in the talk. Again, these are the icons that she created to do this where solar energy shines in the deserts more than other places. And so can we collect that up? And she drew a bucket and pour it out in Madison, Wisconsin in a different place. And can we use chemistry that can break the bonds, transport across country, release that energy, and then transport it back to do a recyclable, returnable thing? And then the actual part of the infographic that she created herself is right there, right? So comes from the template, there's her icons, and then there's her final product that she came up with. And again, I think it only took her two iterations to get to this place. It was pretty fast. And then for this, the, the delivery and the final outcome, it's usually what you do in the lab, right? So the setup is the bigger picture and then the, the delivery is what you're actually doing. And so what she does in the lab, right? We literally label it, what do you do in the lab? She looks at large chemical databases with computer programs and uh, computational function to figure out which chemicals have reversible bonds and which ones are cost effective to find a final answer. And then again, not me creating this, but actual students creating this, this is the infographic that she came up with for that, right? So here you can see all of her candidates. Here's her screening. Here's the ones that have reversible bonds. And then her final output, right? The big money shot right there is storage cost versus energy density. And three candidates that she found would be really good for doing this. So once you have an infographic, that's a very powerful tool right, that you can develop from your research. When you're giving a poster, that infographic can end up right in the middle of your poster. And that way, anyone can come up, anyone from any field in any level can come up and talk to you about your research and understand exactly what you're doing. And then for the more detailed stuff, I'll talk about that in a minute. I wanna show you some more infographics first. So here's another infographic by, oh, here, here's individual, um, transformations from icons into infographics from various students. So this student was looking at building a pair of glasses that would allow a human to see infrared and ultraviolet light just by putting on the glasses. This student was making the argument that we should not be using mice in eye research because mice are nocturnal animals and they're not very much like humans. And so we should be using 13 line ground squirrels instead. And so his whole project is, can we convert over researchers from mice to 13 line ground squirrels? This one is about how cells process stuff and get it outside of the cell. Right? So from inside the cell to outside the cell. And then this one is a very complex research. It's very hard to understand, but using these icons, he was able to create an infographic that allowed people to get into his research. And his research is, can we formulate computer programs that see things just like humans see things? So that's the infographic he created from his icons. So back to seeing you, once you have this infographic, you have it on your poster, right? It allows you to speak to anybody, but then when a collaborator or a peer comes up and wants to talk to you about your detailed research outcome, you can then sideline them right to the edge of your poster and talk about the particular outcomes 
in the data that you've collected. Right? So it'll cover every audience member out there. Here's a infographic by Odalis. Odalis was a new graduate student and did not have any data. So what she did was an infographic on her process to find that data. And so when she gave her presentation, her poster, she just used her infographic, right? And showed people, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm trying to do. And when I get data, I will be happy to show that to you. But right now I don't have any data. But it, it allowed her to feel comfortable speaking to peers and other audience members and saying where she was doing rather than, oh, I don't have any data, I can't speak to anybody. Here's posters, right? So let's talk about posters and let's talk about what Holly was talking about with feedback and iteration. So Taylor, this is Taylor's poster before she took our class, before she learned our method. And she told us when she showed us this poster in class that she, had a hard time reaching people, that people had a hard time understanding what she was talking about. And so she really wanted to use our process to make it easier to understand. And so after going through the process and converting this poster, this was her next poster that she came up with. And you can see that she did do a tiny little infographic here, right? So the loss of hearing, is that an indicator of Alzheimer's and later in stages? And she shows you a brain now. But she took this main part of her research here and converted it over into a visual. And I'll talk more about that visual later on, but I just want you to see it now. I'll show you another poster with iteration and feedback. So Alex came to the class and after learning the process, this was the poster that he produced, right? And when he showed this to the rest of the class, everybody thought it was amazing, right? It's a beautiful poster, but then they gave him feedback and said, well, here's what I see, here's what I feel, here's what I think. When you speak about this, this is what I hear. And so he took all of that feedback and came up with this version of his poster. Now, the first poster was really good, but this poster is more like an infographic. Notice that Alex got very comfortable, right? We didn't tell him to do this. He got comfortable on his own, losing all the words. He decided he didn't need any of the words that he could make his title very easy to understand, make his outcome very easy to understand, show you what his experimentation is, and then just give you headers for each of the data panels. And that was all he decided he needed to do this. So starting with something and then iteration is key. And then the iteration is whatever you decide the iteration is. Holly talked about 10 minute talks with peers. So here you can see the template with the 10 minute talk slides overlaid on top of the template. So your first slide would be your audience entry with your title, and then you would talk about what the current world is, and then what the problem is, and then your question and go on from there. Notice that there's a big red X in the conclusion square. So often when scientists give presentations, they end up saying, well, now let me tell you about my conclusions. The whole reason you need to tell people about your conclusions is they're not engaged, they're not understanding what you're saying, and they're not processing that information. What we find our students do is they do these talks, they don't use conclusions because people are understanding and engaging their entire talk. So when they get to the end, the conclusion is obvious because it's part of their story. So here are some slides from presentations that graduate students and postdocs have done after going through this process. And you notice that these opening slides are incredibly visually rich, right? They've learned how to simplify their titles, not give you all that detail. They're trying to engage you. They're trying to bring you into the process with this. And then they pivot off of these right into the talk, right? And I'll show you some other stuff. Yes, every single talk has a slide with a question, right? So partway into the talk, Holly talked about the setup that leads to a question. There is a slide that just has that question on it. And these are actual questions from actual people who have gone through this process. And the, the questions are very simple. And what it does is it sets up the rest of that talk so that audience is trying to process and engage and understand to figure out what the final outcome is. Right? You, you tell them what the final outcome is, but they're already thinking and processing that ahead of time. 
engaging with you. And then as Holly said, feedback and iteration, we take our students out into the world and we let them talk to people. So they do Saturday science on campus where anybody shows up, right? Kids, adults, scientists, and they speak to them. And they do um, light symposium presentations of their posters to every open audiences. We take them to brew pubs, we take them to coffee shops, and they just speak to anybody, right? And they get feedback from those people. They act, we actually have audience members fill out a rubric for the speaker, and then they go up and talk to them afterwards. What we have found students will tell us is, oh my God, people were interested in what I was saying, right? They actually followed what I was saying and wrote down questions that were like pertinent to my research. And, and they wanted to talk to me at the end. It's, people get overwhelmed by doing this. The, the last thing I want to talk to you today is about is visual. So actually creating individual illustrations that you would put on a poster or in a grant or in your talk. Okay. And again, we use the exact same template, same setup, question, and, and delivery. So often when you have some sort of new discovery, right? So this is one thing that happens in research. You discover something new. No one knows what it's about. And so what we offer you is to tell a story about that. So this did not exist, right? This microarray was discovered. We could use it to do stuff. What could we use it to do? I don't know. Well, let's figure that out so that this research researcher can go out into the world and give a talk and actually talk to collaborators and say, hey, you in the medical community, I need to figure this part out. Can you collaborate with me? Hey, you in the agricultural community, I need to figure this part out. Can you collaborate with me? Hey, you in engineering and manufacturing, can you collaborate with me? I don't have this electronic manifold. I'm gonna to need to build something like that. Hey, you in computer science and software engineering, can you help me write the code and have, help me write the programming to actually make the applications? And so is this what's gonna happen? Who knows, but you need some sort of story that can come from that template in order to collaborate with other people and tell them what you're doing. Another thing that scientists do when they're doing their delivery is they actually start somewhere and then they finish somewhere, right? So here's where we started with this red labeling at this point. And then when we got done, we saw it move to here. And that's fine for the researcher because they understand that data, but the audience, they do not like that whatsoever. Audiences like to see things play out over time. They love the story part of it. So how can we convert this part into a story instead of a beginning and ending is put the middle back in, right? So here's that same slide with the middle. And it's just so much more satisfying to see what happened at six hours and what happened at 12 hours and what happened at 18 hours. And then where was it at 24 hours later? Yes, it's true. It was here at zero and there at 24, but audiences love process. They love story. So let's give that to them. So speaking of process and speaking of giving them the story, what sort of things do scientists do when they're actually doing a talk and preparing stuff, right? So they say, well, I took a Petri dish full of cells and then I did this to them and they ended up in the micro wells. And then I did this to them and then they've run out of room on screen, right? So they, they've cut across the top and they're at the end. And so, well, I have all this big blank area down here, so let's go down, okay? I did this to them and then I've run out of room again. And so I still have this blank area over here. And so the, the, what people wanna do is move into that area, but that's a big mistake because the minute you start going backwards, the audience is lost, right? Audiences can go left or right, they can go top to bottom, they can no longer go backwards. And so this is never gonna work for an audience. Here's a much better way to do that exact same process. So if you turn your head sideways, you can see it's the letter S turned on its side. And what this does is it allows you to talk about your process using the space in front of you and your audience can easily follow your story of process as you go along, okay? Here's another example from a whole different field of research. It works for any kind of research, doesn't matter what it is. This one has step numbers so you don't get lost. And then if you're working on a poster or a grant or a research paper, you can turn it sideways and fill up that space. 
and you can even do very complex stuff with it. Right? So even complex processes can be used in the same manner. Holly talked about show, don't tell. So doing individual visualization, you want to put something on screen that you do not have to explain. If you put something on, up on screen and you have to explain it, then you're not showing, you're telling. So here I've created a graph with two groups of data. I have to tell you there's two groups of data because everything is kind of generic and blank. But I can show you there's two groups of data, right? And then I no longer have to explain to you that there's two groups of data. In fact, I can explain a more complex thing that's going on with the two groups of data or an even more complex thing that's going on with the two groups of data just by showing you that, right? And you've all done this, it's very familiar to you. You probably just didn't realize that you were showing instead of telling, right? Even very complex um, similarities can come out of those two groups of data just by showing it to the audience without telling them. And then I may wanna say that all that data was very similar to each other. And so then I might color code it that way so that I can say, well, I had two groups of data, but they were almost identical to each other. And in this graph, they are identical. Yeah, overwhelming. People shy away from showing stuff like this. And people will tell you, well, you can't show anything like that. I argue you can tell people, you can show this to people if you focus the audience on what you're saying if you show them instead of telling them, right? So if I tried to tell you what was going on in this table, it would be overwhelming because you wouldn't know what to look at. But if I show you where to look, you immediately look to that area. So here we're gonna look at lengths of DNA from five kilobases to 300 kilobases. And we're gonna look at the average number of introns per gene in HS, which is human, and RAND, which is random. If you look at human, and random, you can see in realistic lengths of DNA between 100 kil kilobases and 300 kilobases, those numbers start to solidify around a single digit, okay? If we look at the average exon length in random DNA, it is a single digit because it's random DNA. It can't be anything else. It's just randomly generated. But the interesting point of this data is that if you look at human DNA in, in realistic lengths of DNA, the average exon length also correlates around a single number, right? So I was able to tell you that story out of this big complex table quickly and easily by showing you rather than telling you. Again, graphs, charts, data, stuff like that is very common in science. When we're collecting that data and trying to interpret it and figure out what's going on there, we need to see the data, right? We need to see the error bars. We need to see everything that's happening with that data so we can interpret it and figure it out. But again, when we're talking to an audience, we need to show them the story of the data, not the data. And so one of these drugs is effective and one is not effective, right? So if we use the method of story form science, and actually show you the exact same data in a story instead of the data, I can now tell you that one drug was effective and one was not effective, even though you took the other drug two times during the day, right? I don't have to point it out to you. I can just use my words. You can figure that out for yourself. I can even say something like, well, the effective drug you take before you go to bed and during the night, it, it releases itself in your intestine. And by the time you wake up in the morning, it's ready to go in your system and it's with you throughout the day, right? I didn't have to point at anything. I didn't have to tell you which one it was. You can figure that out because the data is now telling you that story. It's showing you that story. Same data, just showing instead of telling. Color vomit. Right? So we create these illustrations and we vomit color all over them and the audience does not know what to look at or how to parse the information that's in there. I wanna tell you a story about this. I can't do it when everything's colored vividly and bright like this. So if I tone that down and use the method and tell you a story, right? Now the yellow stuff goes together. The light blue stuff goes together. And then I can focus your attention with the red on the thing I really want you to learn about. So you can see how I'm using color 
to tell a story and focus you. Okay. And then I'll end with Taylor. So I'll go back to Taylor's poster. So Taylor spent her entire time on her poster discussing this table and these six graphs. And people walked away not understanding what she was talking about. So the minute she converted it over into this visual, right, she did a couple of things. One, she color coded the regions of the brain to the individual graphs. So now you could actually see where that data came from on the brain. So if you knew the parts of the brain, you knew why that data was important or not important. She also allowed the y-axis to be this. Over here, the y-axis is all over the place. In here, the y-axis is the exact same. And so now you can see that the data across the top is very similar to each other. However, the data across the bottom is very different from each other. And this data, all this data here is the exact same data that's on the left. But when she readjusted the y-axis to be the same, you can now see the differences and what parts of the brain that affects and why that's important for her research. Okay. So today we've shown you story form science. We've shown you the tools that we use. We've given you the five principles of story. And we've tried to convince you that iteration and feedback are very, very important parts of this journey. Okay. The answer to our question in the beginning is yes, science can, scientists can communicate to any, any audience. Imagine being able to talk to your brothers and sisters or your parents and having them understand exactly what you do in your daily life and having them understand all of that. So here is the outcome for when we do these workshops and when we do these classes. This is what the participants tell us, okay? They tell us that the course is transformative. So better than 90% of the people who go into these things and go through this process come out the other side completely transformed in how they do their science communication. They no longer do it the old way anymore. They do it this new way. They tell us that it makes their lives way, way easier when they have to give a talk, when they have to make a poster, or when they have to do a paper, that they now have this template that they can just plug stuff into and their life is much, much easier. They're spending way less time on making posters and doing research talks and doing uh, papers. We have a lot of non-native English speakers who come to us and run through this process with us. And what we find they tell us is their confidence level goes way up because what they were doing before is explaining everything and they're non-native English speakers. So once they start showing everything, their job becomes much easier. And so they have reported that to us. They, uh, people who participate have said over and over again that they were so grateful that they learned how to critique and give feedback to other scientists, that they were always intimidated by that or fearful of doing that. And after going through this process, they became very comfortable with doing that. They also have told us over and over again that it makes it much easier to collaborate with people outside of their field. Right? They suddenly can talk to people in other fields and get them to understand why they wanna collaborate with each other. And then job talks, symposium talks, much greater research success, much greater increase in success rates on those things. People who use this process in a job talk generally get multiple offers at jobs, not just one. This one kind of blew us away. We hear it over and over again from the people. I actually do better bench science, science now. And, and what they tell us is because they understand how their science fits into the bigger picture now, they can actually design their experiments better. They can actually talk about it better. And they actually know where they are in the chain, what they're doing affects the other people in the lab. And so that was a very big surprise for us. What does it cost? It only costs three hours a week. And the longest course is eight weeks. So if you give us three hours a week for eight weeks, we can teach you this process. But of course we have much shorter venues, right? We can do a one hour workshop. We can do a three hour workshop. We can do a four week course or a six week course. And then you can go to our website and see testimonials and examples of course. And the last thing I'll end on is this summer, during the summer, Holly and I do a Zoom course. It's a six week course. So you'll learn three minute presentation, 10 minute presentation and infographics in that course.
and that's open now. So if anyone wants to sign up, it's online. People anywhere in the world can sign up for it. And then with that, I'll end and take any questions you guys might have. It doesn't matter what software you use. We've had people use all kinds of software. Um, BioRender is one of the big ones because it's it works very well. But you literally can use anything. So the the one I showed you, Sing You, she did that in PowerPoint. Is dependent on you and your PI because we have PIs to deal with too. And PIs say, there's no way you're not putting that on. This must be on your poster, right? And so it's a it's a personal decision for each individual. And like Alex here, he said to himself, I don't want those words. I don't need those words. This is what I'm going to do, right? Again, it's not up to us. We don't tell you what to do. You can see that Taylor was far more comfortable keeping more words. She was not comfortable getting rid of all the words. And so that's her personal preference. We take you to wherever you want to go not where we think you should go. So we teach you, we give you feedback, they give you feedback, and then you decide how much you wanna put on or not put on, okay? We would argue that something like Odalis, right? This was very, very effective. And you could literally visually walk through this without her there and figure out what was going on. It, it, it depends on you though. So if you want more, you put more on. If you want less, and you're comfortable with less, that's, that's part of the iteration and feedback. We let you present so you can see what it feels like to have less on there. And then when people understand you better, you're like, wow, I had less on there and they understood me more. So I'm gonna continue down that road because more people understood me. So, right? That's what I could say anyway. I don't know if Holly, if you have anything to add. No, I think, you know, you find out, um, you find out when you practice and you get feedback, you find out what works and what doesn't work so well. We actually take our students when they're doing poster presentations, we actually take them and actually show them how to engage with the audience. So we don't have them stand by their poster and wait. We actually have them reach out to people walking by and, and query them and question the people walking by and get them to come to their posters. So we actually teach you how to do that part too. And I saw a question in the chat about, does it matter what sort of format people are gonna see your poster? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, most in most cases you're standing by it. So you don't really need to have a lot of words on there. You'll supply that. Um, a lot of times though, posters are relegated to the, the corridor graveyard, you know, um, then you might, you might want to have more words on there. It depends on how you want that product to work for you. Yes, but it's more about you, right? Always it's about you and that audience and reaching that audience. And so the venue is less important it's more about you and the audience. And so that's what we focus on. We've, we've had many students who have come to us and said, I go to give a presentation for my poster and no one stops. I go, I'm there for three hours and I had two people stop. And then they do this, right? And then they go give a presentation and they're like, oh my God, I can't speak anymore because I, I spoke for the whole three hours straight. I never had a break. So it's more about getting your research out than minding some rules that somebody says you have to do this or have to do that. Your, your first figure in any paper should be a summary figure of everything. Every paper you put out, research paper, the very first figure, someone should be able to look at that and figure out all of the research that comes after it from that first figure. And, that, and that's why journals brought about table of contents figures. They're trying to get that summation into one image that they can put on their website so people can look at the images because they know that they're processing images much faster than words. They know that when they see something that will get your eyeballs to look at that visual rather than a bunch of words. And so that's why they're doing table of contents figures. But the research papers I've worked on, a thousand research papers in the last 30 years, we always create the first figure as an overview figure of the whole thing. 
So that's where that fits in. And then Holly can talk about using this method. Yeah, I, um, I think your question, Beth, Bethany, was mostly about the in, infographic or the figure. Um, if you think about how we write papers, they really are based on a story. Um, we start with a very general introduction. So that's the current world. And then we narrow down to talking about a specific problem. Then there's the, uh, the approach we think we might take. And then there's the research questions. And then there's a methodology. Here's what you did. You show your results. And then in the end, you know, you show your final results. Conclusions, yeah, we do do conclusions. They're, they're really expected in a manuscript, whereas we don't necessarily have to have them in a talk. But, and then you talk about, uh, you know, the future and ramifications and, uh, you know, uh, things you have to watch for because, um, you know. So it really is, when you think about it, it's exactly like a story. And when in our class, we have editors coming in from various journals and they always say, unbidden from us, you have to get the story out. You have to tell the story. That's because that's how people think, we think in stories. And I wanted to say, um, you know, when people tell, give these talks, nobody leaves the talk thinking, oh, what? that was a story. You don't, you don't think it was a story. You just know it was really interesting. It just works on your brain like that. 